Right. Uh, thank you, Candice. Now, uh, also about the, the handout, Candice, if you want to make mention of that. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and post in the chat a link to the handout that Rex will be going over today. So you can click on that link and you can download the PDF. Um, you can also find this PDF on the landing page for the website at linuxfoundation.org slash webinars. Right, thank you. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'm an independent consultant here based in Northern Virginia in the US, but of Australian origin, if you're interested in where my accent comes from. Um, I've uh, been working with uh, IT standards for nearly 39 years now, and while I've learned a lot about what to do, I've learned a lot about what not to do. Uh, a couple of things I'll just mention uh, in advance here. Uh, almost all of my work has been involved with uh, software standards, and in recent years, I've done a bit on process standards. Uh, the big difference is, is that software standards uh, can be validated. You can run all kinds of tools and things over them, which of course you can't do with process standards. So while I would try to be somewhat generic, uh, a number of the things will touch into the area, uh, assuming that you're in uh, producing a spec for software related uh, technology. And I believe there'll be a, a session or some questions about uh, letting you identify which you're doing. We'll be interested to know that. Um, it, within the IT spec, I've worked primarily with programming language specifications, but also very large environmental and uh, things like the Microsoft Office file format when they went from doc to docx and all the associated things. So I'm the editor was for that for 17 years of that. And we finished up with a 6,500 page specification. Uh, since then, I've worked on 10 page specifications, which is rather interesting. So let's uh, click off now and see, look at the table of contents. Uh, you're seeing here a crude slide in a Word file that exactly mimics the handout you can download. So uh, pretty much everything I say will be touched on in the actual text. So no need to make copious notes. If I talk something extra, I would generally suggest uh, this is new and you could make a note about that. My intent is to cover uh, hopefully the first 10 topics here. We have a limited amount of time plus with Q&A. So let's get started then. So firstly, we're talking about producing a formal specification and the audience for such a thing uh, is there are three different kinds of reader. Firstly, people who are going to implement the, the uh, build an implementation or create a process. Clearly they need to know what it is they're trying to build and what the constraints and rules are. It's possible that somebody will be building some sort of a, a test suite or a checklist uh, that uh, can be used against it. And in that sense, um, an implementation does what they think should be done. The test suite checks that they did it, but the test suite might find errors or problems in the implementation and the two sort of sides feed off each other. We'll talk a little bit more about the test suite later. And then finally, the users of the tools or process that want to be able to learn about what is the goal of this process, what's included and what's not included, and what are the implications of moving the process or tool from one environment to another. For example, in a programming language environment, you might say, well, uh, I've got all of this Java code. What will happen if I move it from this environment from Linux over to Windows or such? Um, and uh, you have to go look at the spec to see what they say about what's guaranteed versus what might depend on a platform. And we'll talk more about terminology later. So that's basically uh, our audience. We're writing it for uh, those three possibilities, the first and the third bullet, possibly the second. Certainly, even if there's no formal test suite, uh, people uh, will be writing their own test in general. So the lesson to learn here then is, uh, write a clear and concise charter for the formalization effort. What are the goals? And just as importantly, the non-goals. And separate the wouldn't it be nice to thoughts. I cannot emphasize that enough. Uh, and I've written widely over the years on my blog about romantic aspects of things. That is the reality versus the romantic. Wouldn't it be nice if and the dreamy stuff. If you're doing a non-trivial specification in terms of size or complexity involving companies or competition in the marketplace, you'll fairly quickly figure out you need to pin some things down about the scope of the project and how far you're willing to go and what sort of budget that may be involved. 
in my case, I'm a paid project editor uh, for large projects and um, and these kinds of things. So when you're when you're paying editorial staff to manage and maintain things, you're pretty quickly talking in the tens of thousands of dollars for a various kind of support model of these kinds of things. So uh, write down what it is you're trying to do, get some consensus and, and separate and prioritize uh, the necessary versus wouldn't it be nice. Um, so do we have any questions, ladies, and uh, anything to do with number one? No questions at this point, Rex. All right, good. So now let's get into what's the starting point. Uh, most, maybe many or most projects start with a person or a small group doing a project, a research or a proprietary project that eventually even starts shipping. And once things become popular and word gets out, then there's some interest uh, outside of the original involvement, either in the same organization for other projects or outside organizations. And so um, that's what I term about consolidating prior art. If you get some interest at that point and say, oh, let's try to uh, make this more formal and handle a bunch of questions and dark corners. And so uh, the consolidation of prior art basically says, let's take all the information that exists and try to pull together a common specification that involves and tries to consider uh, pretty much all of those particular groups. Uh, the important thing is, is that can easily involve breaking existing implementations. So there, are, there may be uh, uh, business forces involved. Uh, for example, when I started in 1984 on the C language uh, standard, there was something like uh, 50 to 100 vendors, mainstream vendors of C compilers out there, um, many of which had done things in slightly different ways based on there being incomplete specifications or it was not specified. And so being involved in compromise, and it could be business, a serious business to, you know, how dare you break my implementation on which I have a thousand customers and tell me it's broken. Uh, how can you accommodate me and things like that. So um, basically, um, that's, I think, the most common scenario. But again, it comes with its costs. The design by committee is that you've got a good idea, but it hasn't actually been implemented yet. Basically, you've got a, a proof of, um, um, uh, of concept, but you've decided to do that. That's less likely used in the software industry. I'm aware of one project, and that was the Ada programming language, which was designed by committee to start with. And as you can imagine, uh, that's a whole different process involving lots of different dynamics. And the good news for that is you're starting with a blank slate, uh, and you can do anything. The bad news is you have to do everything <laughs> because you don't really have any sort of guideline. I've worked in both of those in some sense. The first one mostly because I'm consolidating on prior art by a widespread group of, um, of vendors and things. I've also had it from a, just from a single vendor. In the case of the C Sharp programming language, there was an internal spec, but it was basically entirely for Microsoft's internal consumption. And my job was to now make that applicable uh, to the world at large. And I, 23 years later, I continue in that role. PHP, which the language in which Facebook was originally written in, has never had a formal specification. And when I was invited to write one, again, I had to deal with several disparate uh, kind of audiences out there and implementations and a lot of things that had never been specified. Um, so that's the starting point, to know exactly where you're coming from, and that will set the tone on the kind of organization you'll need to manage it, the kind of politics you'll have in terms of the compromise and such things. So very important. Questions, anything yet? All right. So now, number three, this may very well be uh, the biggest business decision you will make because this is a business decision. And so don't uh, fool yourself other than that. It'll grow and creep gradually. It'll take up time and, and resources. Firstly, uh, I'll just use the term standard development organization, SDO, as a general term of something that publishes a formal specification. 
Yes, it could be ISO, it could be ANSI in the US, it could be the British Standards Institute, it could be OASIS Consortium or whatever. Or it could be your technical committee that you have created or are about to create. It, it's not necessarily a formally nationally, internationally recognized idea, but that's the basic thing. Now, it's interesting to note the procurement process of some organizations such as the EU and uh, federal and state governments require certain products conform by accredited. So first of all, that suggests that you need to be publishing with an accredited, whatever that means, SDO, and they will have their own requirements as to what is involved in that. There will need to be some sort of a certification process as to say, yes, you do in fact comply, and they might involve some pooling for that. So that's an extra thing. But again, uh, it may very well be you don't have any of that, and it's simply an open source project that you're willing to share, and that's how things go. So in my case, the C Sharp spec is now an open source project the world can contribute. Uh, ultimately, we distill it into a, a PDF that is published through ECMA International as a standard development organization. So we basically have the, the, the best of both worlds. The process of producing it is very informal, but the actual process of publishing it is actually formal. And that's an important thing to keep in mind that maybe you could uh, take advantage of as well. So a technical committee then is the one that produces the formal specification. And as I said, the technical committee may very well be the SDO itself. Again, stress most importantly, get clear in your mind the needs versus wants, make lists of them and review them from time to time to keep reminding yourself why this is a want and not a need. And then maybe you'll change priorities and certain wants might become needs as uh, things evolve and as marketplaces arise. Now, um, the one thing I said that uh, keep in mind, if you want to go with a, an SDO, then you need to decide that early on because some of them have large and complex sets of publishing requirements. And uh, the last thing you want to come to is to have a perfectly fine spec the industry knows and loves. And when you try to submit it to a, a recognized SDO, they require you to basically reformat the entire thing. Now, for a 10, 20, 50 page spec, that's not a big deal. But the 6,500 page spec that I was editor on for many years, when you were told that, um, my uh, approximations on what it would take to make it comply to the format was $100,000 plus of people time and proofing. And the end result would be technically no better. And we would probably introduce errors along the way. So certainly you want to know very early in the process before you commit to actually formatting your core spec into any particular uh, uh, manner as to where this thing is destined. And you might say, well, we're going to do it this way. And we hope to be able to delay the choice later on. You can only delay it so far. For example, if you choose Word or you choose GitHub or some other tool, how are you going to get things between one environment to the other? Most importantly, people join a technical committee for the technical challenge of what's gone, not for the formatting and the administration. And they've proofed it and made all kinds of fixes. And the last thing they're going to do is when you say, oh, we've reformatted this now with tools. Could you proof this to make sure we got it right? That is not something they're going to want to do. And so all kinds of interesting editorial errors that could be introduced in the transposition process can uh, go into the published version. So will you be bound by a particular set of rules? It's either yes or no. Once you make the decision, you should expect to be locked into it forever. And even if you don't, you're not locked into it, it's okay to know what some of the groups require out there and borrow various aspects, as some can make sense. Indeed, all of the standards that I've used that are outside of, say, a formal SDO have borrowed heavily on what I think are good ideas from some of those organizations. They're just not requirements. And so in the handout, you will have a URL, although it's interesting here because, uh, yes, yeah, so if you've got the electronic handout, these are all hyperlinks, and you can go to the ISO directives, uh, which uh, talk about how to prepare something, uh, along with the style guide, which is above and beyond the, the actual requirements. And off the top of my head, those two combined are something like 100 plus pages. So it's not a light commitment to say, go the ISO route. 
and you would have to understand what you're getting into again before you commit to very much formatting so you don't go down the wrong path. Now, this particular seminar is generic in that we're not going to talk about ISO specifics in general, but uh, there is a possibility we might offer such a follow-on one specifically for ISO, and in the polling, you should indicate interest if you wish to know more about that. Rex, we have a really great question from Christopher Punches, which is, how do you differentiate between the want and need in the in the process? And I, I think there's two components to that, want and need in terms of the right. technical scope and want and need in terms of whether yes. to take a project right. to well, SDF. Several things. Firstly, they can change. I find that every three to six months, I'm a different person in terms of my wants and needs for my business and other life experiences. So I can maintain a list and I review it on a regular basis to see if circumstances change in reality or my thinking changes. Secondly, if you're in a small group or you're starting out as a single person or several people, get a core group of people to talk about these kinds of issues. And certainly you want people who don't necessarily agree with you. You don't want yes people to say, yeah, that's a great idea. You need them to stand up and say, push back. No, that isn't a good idea. And, and the more, you know, the, the list of needs you see grows, you need to then factor in what is the needs, the complexity of the technical committee you'll need and the resources. My boss says I can do this for 5% of my time, but now it's going to take 10 or 15%. So be very specific about uh, the needs and try to quantify them in terms of the impact they'll have on the, the specification, the details. So for example, you say, it'd be really nice to have a test suite that we could run, that all members could run against their implementations from time to time. I can tell you that is not a simple task to do. That could be a full-time job for somebody on a non-trivial spec, at least for some months. So that's the best advice I can be is that review your own thinking and the situation and also have a small core group of people committed to it um, who can discuss this kind of thing and push back on a regular basis uh, if necessary. Okay. Any others? That's it for now. Okay. So um, conformance. So you can write a formal spec and uh, you can say, well, that's a wonderful thing. That's precisely what I wanted to do. But um, how can somebody actually, how can you tell if some implementation actually complies with it? And more to the point, certain uh, uh, purchases of things will require there be a certification or that you pass the test. And the set of tests, particularly for software, could be so um, large that you, in fact, make this a commercial product. Uh, when we did the C language standard, there fairly quickly were a number of, of fairly large and complex uh, commercially available suites. There were three that I know of that were then available to run against it. Uh, and so the JavaScript committee, of which I chaired for a couple of years, a few years ago, uh, as part of the committee activity, does in fact have a test suite. But again, you needed a very dedicated person or several other people to, pr to produce that. Otherwise, you've got a spec that says, this is how the world should be, and then you have the world as it is, and who's checking between the two. Uh, if, if nobody is really taking that seriously, then what's the point of having the formal spec apart from ego? And so think about that in the terms of compliance. And we talk about the um, degree to which an implementation uh, agrees. So uh, the idea is that if you put out a new version of a specification, say version three, the world is still on version two, and some of them might be on version one, and they aren't going to immediately comply with three, and they might not for a year or two. So anybody requiring compliance uh, says, well, we can't expect that they you have version three yet for a certain amount of time. There are people with partial implementations. There are, there are 2.5. There are people that have extensions beyond and above that. So we'll talk a bit more about flavors later on. Um, so the content of the uh, of the spec will be text that is normative or informative or non-normative. The normative text says, here's what you've got to do. You have to provide this capability and it has to have this syntax to invoke it and it has to have this kind of behavior. Um, and uh, But you might also weaken that, as we'll see later. Informative stuff is that, oh, by the way, um, we're, we're going to be helpful and we're going to provide you some notes and examples. In a strict um, 
uh, model, there are people out there who will provide specs that say, well, you know, maybe you need a PhD in mathematics to understand this, but that's not our problem. This is what we've done. The, the realistic situation is you've got a lot of people doing open source projects and they want to be able to read things in lame and sort of English with the few rules explained. And so it's useful to have examples, of course, of schema or of source code or output or data, things like this, uh, which conforms or doesn't and explains why. There could be notes and says, well, um, we said way back here, uh, 50 pages ago, this was the case, and that matters right here. We're not, we're not going to restate that because we don't want to say things more than once, but we're bringing your attention to the fact that you should go back and understand that term in this context. So informative text is done, and then you can have conditionally normative. You could say, oh, um, if you support uh, IEEE floating point arithmetic, which is very commonly a okay, decision in, in uh, computing and programming languages, then you have to do this. But if you don't, ignore this whole chapter or annex. So you can have, and you could have a paragraph or sections that are conditionally normative. And so the idea is you have normative and informative and an implementation that complies completely has to follow all the normative rules. Now, how do you identify normative uh, text? There are two common ways I've come in touch with. The first here, which is required by ISO, simply uses the word shall, shall not, may, may not, and, and some others, which is sort of old English, shall, thou shall, or thou shalt, et cetera, and not. That's the way it is, and that's required by them. And if you go that route, so it's not just a matter of do I want an SDO, you have to understand the implication of choosing a particular SDO as to how that's going to impact your whole, whole project. That may very well cause you to decide not to go with a particular SDO at all because of the onerous requirements. And so saying shall, for example, in an ISO standard, if I say shall, that's a conformance requirement. But if I say must, that's typically the note or example. It's not normative. It's not a requirement, even though it sounds like it, it carries the same weight. Now, another common alternative used in open source and others uses uppercase equivalents as defined in an RFC. Uh, so that's very common. They do stick out. You can, you can see them much more easily than a hidden English word like shall. Um, and also, you can search for them mechanically in the source. So you could extract all the rules mechanically by looking for certain keywords without knowing the, the um, context of them. So there are advantages and disadvantages of these approaches. But that's an important way. How do you identify which is being normative? Now, the thing too is that we'll talk later, but if you're using a collaborative development environment to maintain the text, say like a, a Google Docs or a, a GitHub, uh, every man and his dog can actually submit and make corrections and improvements, et cetera. You no longer have a central pipeline of an editor managing a single document like in the good old days. So now the editorial task uh, becomes, well, I have to go review all of the changes that people have made to verify that they have, in fact, used the correct compliance terminology. So that is a change in the traditional editorial model. So again, you'll have to decide what mechanism you use to identify that. No reason to invent your own scheme, but you could take one of the existing ones if you're required to, or you could take the existing one and modify it or extend it if you have other kinds of situations to deal with. Right, now ideally, all requirements of the spec are absolute with regards to reproducible behavior. You do this, and this is what comes out the other end, uh, and you must not do this. That's, in fact, not allowed. And so it seems a no-brainer that it should be absolute in the ideal case. However, it's a widespread practice to have a number of flavors of behavior. So, for example, um, if um, I'm consolidating prior art and I have five different implementations already out there selling and existing, uh, fine and providing a great service, and let's say between the five of them, they're using two different ways of approaching something, then how do we deal with that? You Can you force three of them to change to the other two or vice versa? That obviously gets a lot of people upset and, and breaking their stuff. Could you come up with a new approach and force all of them to be broken? That sounds like a worse idea. You could also say, we're going to make the implementation defined, uh, the behavior implementation defined, 
which says the spec places no requirements on what you in fact have to do. You have to not break the world, it has to succeed, but the vendor has to document in their own documentation as to what the behavior is. Clearly, if you are a user wanting to move from one environment to the other, then you need to look for those kinds of flags because that's the stuff that can change when you go from, say, a, a Macintosh to a Windows to a Linux type windowing environment, for example. You have locale specific things. So if I key in a name, a, a, a somebody's family name, and I have that converted to upper or lower case or title case, um, I, you know, am I handling a non USA English letters? And so certainly the behavior of certain things is locale specific. And we'll talk briefly about locales a little bit later. They could be undefined or unspecified. This gets right outside of reproducible behavior. If you do this, all bets are off. We have nothing to say about that. So uh, again, you have to understand uh, which ones you know you want to have and be prepared to add others. If you come in saying it's always going to be absolute, that's an interesting uh, rule, and you need to then revisit that from time to time. Now, deprecation. So time goes on, and you find that there's a better way of doing something than you had. And so you would like to provide a replacement. Now it's bad style in a spec to in a new edition to say, okay, uh, we've rewritten the Old Testament here and this is what you've got to do because that's going to break everybody. And if you give them one revisions worth of notice, that would be good industry standard. It could be a year or six, 12, 18 months. We're, going, we're giving you now a new way of doing this and we feel so strongly about it that we're going to deprecate the previous way of doing it. And we may very well remove that from a future version of the spec. Now, most often that doesn't happen. It stays there as a recommended against historical artifact, but you'll still find software or implementations out there using it forever. And indeed, there have been rare cases where a committee dropped something and was sued into a very onerous, long-term drawn out thing to say you've broken something that's working in the insurance industry around the world for years, and you have no right to do that. So just think about deprecation. You have the ability, better to get it right first time, but right is subjective as time goes by when new techniques are available, or you find the old decision was inadvisable for some particular reason. And then this is something not in the handout, but I've already talked a little bit about. Will you develop a conformance test suite if you're software-based? because that's uh, and make it available to the world at large and to implementers um, so that uh, you know that's the thing but again that is a non-trivial commitment so questions about conformance or anything up to this point is there somebody still out there no questions as okay. of yet yeah. all right all right right now a few legal considerations, I'm not going to dwell on this, other than to say, for example, if you're in a committee and you're all making contributions, who owns those? And things like this. So some fundamental things there. Importantly, have at least one person in your group uh, in the TC who's interested in this stuff and uh, to learn about what the potential issues are. And depending if you're using a form, an existing SDO, they will already have requirements about and non-discriminatory and royalty-free such things and whatever, and copyrights and trademarks and whatever. So again, most TC participants are there for the technical sort of challenges, not for the administrative or legal. So make sure you that you don't want to get waylaid. Um, and we had a, an early stage of a stand I was in, a person uh, felt slighted that we hadn't handled his comments on early ballots, and uh, he took it to his US congressman who tried to then raise it through uh, ANSI within the US. So again, all kinds of interesting adventures in my 39 years. So nothing that I wanna raise there. I, I'm not, I don't know that field, so I can't possibly answer any questions about it, but I think there are people in the LF and Seth and others can be brought to bear and, and possibly follow up webinars about some of these issues. Um, on on yeah. the legal considerations, um... Rex, I think it's also worth calling out how important that scope that you mentioned at the top of the, the workshop here uh, is 
to understanding the legal considerations here, when you define that project scope, that really does become a bounding box for how that final output might be used and what licenses to the underlying intellectual property are going to be applied. Right. So uh, these two things are very well connected. I, yeah. We also did get a, a question uh, yeah. right here in the Q&A. Does a mathematically formal way to write a spec exist, or do you know of any efforts that um, are, are presently underway for writing? Right. Uh, uh, yeah. Perhaps hold that thought until we get down and talk about grammars and validation. That might uh, open up, uh, answer some of that, and then we can revisit if there are still other questions. But uh, yes, there are there are there are standards on on formal specification syntax. Um, and uh, BNF, Bacchus Nerf format, and extended BNF, eBNF. But uh, let, if we can put that one on hold. Okay, um, specification packaging. Okay, so you're ready now to start writing something. How do you organize it? Well, the simplest thing is, well, I want to describe uh, uh, a widget, and I can do that in 20, 30 pages, and I can do it in a single part. That is, it's a, a, a single document typically, and we'll call it a single part. It'll be published with some designating number as a standalone thing. Uh, and maybe that's how you start out. You might have a multi-part where, in fact, you have a related number of parts, typically each one mapping into a document physically, but we don't care really how mapping works. And so what might that be for? So you could, for example, say we have a core specification for some technology, and that could be in part one. You then might say, well, yes, but then when we apply it to this particular kind of industry, then uh, this applies or this industry, and you might have industry specific parts that follow on. Um, and so people can then choose to comply with various paths through that set. They comply with the core uh, part zero at one, and they comply with uh, one or more of the other parts. And a part need not all be normative, you could in fact have a whole part that was nothing more than a tutorial, um, test cases, statistics, research, white papers, whatever you want. That could be anywhere in any of the parts, but you could have parts totally dedicated so you're maintaining the documentation and related things along with it. But they're all related and they all make sense to be part of ISO, IS, one, two, three, four, five, rather than have uh, you know, five disparate numbers over a 10-year period, that is no obvious relation between them. And so, so that's not uncommon for, for non-trivial size ones. Uh, the 6,500-page spec I worked on for 17 years had, in fact, four parts, although it could easily have been broken into probably 10 or 12. Um, multiple separate specifications, which are unrelated or not closely related. Now, you could change between this. You could start out with option one and later on realize you want to add more and you change to a multi-part, presuming again your SDO supports that, has some way to deal with that. Again, that's useful to know up front. Even if you don't think you need part two or three, nice to know what your options are when you make commitments. And then three, again, you may or may not need that. So again, consider how it might be mapped into the editing platform. So again, uh, lots of things are interrelated uh, here, and you really want to do the homework and read this whole thing and consider it in detail before you commit down a path, because then uh, changing may be uh, quite difficult. So, is your specification likely to grow with respect to the number of components? Will you have optional components? Will each of those, you know, go into a part so that conformance, you can actually comply by providing 10 of the 100 optional parts uh, the components and not all of them. How will a revision of one component impact the others? If you've got everything in one basket, then anything you change from an editorial change to adding a feature will require balloting, review, and revision of that whole thing. Whereas if it's multi-part, only one of the parts that the parts that are affected need in fact be changed. So think of the modularity there in terms of the administrative impact of maintaining this kind of thing. You could also, on a multi-part or multi-specification, you could have different technical committees or subgroups within a larger committee working on each of those. So again, they're asynchronous, they can meet separately, different time zones, whatever, uh, and so that's very important to do that. So you don't have the whole committee dealing with every little thing. You can also break the committee up. For example, 
as during those, she and I served on the ECMA TC39 JavaScript. They used to be all in one, and now they've broken into a parent committee that handles business and core stuff, and they now have task groups one, two, and three below them, which are somewhat autonomous and deal with specific components of the technology outside of the core stuff. So again, think about that short and long term. And you can see that some of these things take way out of the realm of a, a backyard project that you're thinking, this sounds like a good idea. Okay, any more questions? We have a question on um, conformance using test cases. Uh, so this is, can you elaborate on how conformance using test cases could look like? I am writing a spec for a GUI program used by a small company. Right. Um, I, in the C-sharp, where I'm the only thing I've really spent time with, we've developed our own tools. So we're using GitHub, and inside of the actual uh, spec itself, we have HTML comments, which, of course, you can put anything in there. But the syntax we put in there actually complies with JSON, J-S-O-N notation, just because we chose to be. And so we have a tool that says, oh, when you run into one of these, uh, you can go in and extract all the actual all the contents of the code block that follows, and you can go off and then actually excuse me, I'm getting yeah, uh, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. We do that for grammar so that when you get to grammar, uh, it actually validates the grammar. But we also do it for the for all the examples of source code in there. We extract it and then have third party tools outside do that. We'll talk a bit more about that a bit further if I can defer that one under that one. All right. Any other questions? So now, so we're going to write some words, but what format will it be in? If you go with an SDO that has more than a few rules, they're going to dictate that. But here's my 10 cents worth of 39 years of writing under those rules. Uh, and it's in bold. Uh, the shape and format of a specification should be determined as much as possible by the committee producing it. After all, one presumes they know their subject matter best and its audience, and they have more than a little idea of what the industry needs, wants, and will tolerate. Being told that you have to, in fact, format your section headers precisely this way by, say, ISO, doesn't impact the utility and correctness of the spec. And I, I for one, push back at every one of those things that I say are busy work. In the idea, if the SDO has a whole division dedicated to maintaining what documents should look like, to me, that's, that's, that, that's a solution looking for a problem. And it's just way too onerous. And so um, you need to think entirely about that as to are you being forced into an approach that doesn't fit what you think is the best model for your thing. And again, that can have impact on the way you go. So I'm a, now a, uh, a convert to collaborative platforms. And while it changes the editing model, where the editor used to be the, the bottleneck and could do everything and, and control what went into the spec, that is no longer the case, but the editor now has to go review it. But the idea that a member of the committee or a member of the public in an open project could go online at two o'clock in the morning, Tasmanian Australian time, and say, oh, I found a typo, or this doesn't look right, they've missed something here, and actually make a proposed fix right there in real time is a fantastic thing as long as you monitor that activity and they it's a tentative thing until it's reviewed appropriately. That will cut down on the editor's administration and the frustration of participants no end because they see a problem and they can do something about it rather than reporting it as an issue and trying to explain it and letting somebody else take up and apply it. Basically put your money where your mouth is and tell us the solution and hopefully actually apply it and we'll get back to you whether we think that's acceptable. So I, I can't understate that importance. And allow the organization and form to be as lightweight as possible. Certainly if you go GitHub, that's lightweight by design. It's frustratingly lightweight because you say, oh darn, I want to underline something and there's no way to do that. Or I want more out of tables than I can actually get. And we can talk a bit more about that later, but uh, the intent to be as lightweight as possible, I think, is good. Maybe you can have other tools to render that can add certain things. And so, again, allow the organization maximum flexibility in deciding styles, fonts. ISO tells you that anything in a constant width font has to be Korean new. 
And uh, it's very hard to find modern publishing people in the world who think Kuri Anu is a, is a pleasant font to look at versus uh, something else. And so, had, and whether you, ha what bullets, what symbols you use for numbering, all of these things could be dictated to you that you don't care for. Uh, you can't have tables within tables in, uh, uh, in ISO. All kinds of stuff that can severely impact um, your spec and where you might want to take it. So here's my editor, wearing my editor's hat. The SDO shouldn't get in the way of the experts writing the spec. All right. So I feel extremely strongly about that. Rex, question. we have a, yeah, we have a question from our friend, Joel. Um, Joel points out, and this is related to versioning of a spec, that um, spec specified technology is generally always evolving new features breaking changes etc when you are starting to write a specification is there a general rule when you can call that version say 1.0 complete does it have to specify everything in the technology or can you uh, call a subset of the technology 1.0 if your content meets a particular goal that you set out to meet right yeah so certainly part of the charter which you may modify over time so uh, in the JavaScript world, they went for some years between releases and the industry was saying, well, we really want, you know, we know we're all working on stuff, but uh, we need some stability and something for procurement, and whatever. So they bought into the idea of we are going to produce a new edition of the spec annually, you know, March, April, May, whatever it is, and you can bank on that. And whatever we've got completed at that time, we're going to put in there. So that's fine, and they've done that. And uh, the C sharp spec, we're also moving to an annual one, although we're tracking commercial releases. So when you go out there and use uh, a version of C sharp, it's version seven or eight or nine or ten, and our specs are tracking that. And so we're constrained to make the content of the spec match uh, what was actually at that particular level. And so there's, you know, but you need room for middle ground to be able to say we're going to cut off. And but again. Uh, when I when I worked with Linux Foundation on some of these things, like I think SPDX had its own worldwide numbering scheme, and we were going to do an ISO standard. We wanted to call it version two because that's what the world knew, even though it was the first ISO standard. We took some flack for that. We said, "No, you don't understand. The world knows this as this particular version two, and we need to we need to follow the industry's lead on tracking the numbers." So certainly um, important to revise, uh, revisit at times uh, the, the scope and how you're doing. Things always take longer to deliver than you believe. So you may have good reason to say we're either delaying the release or we're going to ship it with fewer features than we had anticipated, as long as they all hang together, for example. All right. Any other questions? Right, then eight, we've talked a little about there, uh, how I'm in favor of that, so I'll skip by that. Now, in either of the approaches here, um, um, let's say you go with ISO, and ISO actually requires you to do stuff in Word. You say, whoa, that's over my dead body, and a lot of people say that. But um, then you basically have the format you're working in, if you can get a collaborative mechanism, uh, is the format you'll deliver. But it's entirely possible that you will be uh, in some other environment where you will maintain the source of the spec in one format, and you might have to, or you might have to, or you might choose to render it in another format, uh, like Word or PDF or, H or HTML. Of course, could come out of Markdown with some table of contents and things like that. Uh, and so you want to then understand what tools will be might be involved in doing that. For example, as I said. Uh, it, I, if you want to have tables more than what uh, GitHub can do or more than something, then you have to put in raw HTML. Now, any tool that converts your GitHub uh, markdown into something else now has to understand all of those kinds of exceptions and deal with it. And Pandoc and various other things will not know how to deal with it. So uh, you, you need to look at what tools might I need to help me either to publish the spec or to verify and do certain kinds of checking in that spec. And let's move on because that the next one will comes into part of that as well with the tooling. So now if you're dealing with a programming language, then you clearly have to state the syntax of each particular kind of statement or form and these kind of things. And you can use a formal grammar notation or you can describe it in narrative. 
Now, the earlier question was about, is there a formal way to write things? And so, yes, you write a formal grammar. You could write a formal grammar for English or Latin or French, although it's, it's, it's impossible to get correct because the exceptions to the rules and the whole context. But when you write a, a, a formal grammar for your own sort of language, then uh, you can make it as explicit and unambiguous as you choose. And that's certainly the technique to be involved. And the, as I said, there's an ISO standard, I believe, for BNF, Bacchus NER format, BNF. You go to Wikipedia and extended BNF. And, and there are others out there. There are, there are numerous others. And uh, in the C-sharp world, we have switched to now um, uh, Antler, A-N-T-L-R. And that's widespread, but it does have its own limitations in certain ways. Uh, and there are other tools. Uh, in the, the, the uh, Unix world, you have the Lex and Yak and various other ways of dealing with grammars and Bison. And there are all kinds of formal grammar notations out there. Um, and so you don't need a very complex language. For example, and you're not just restricted to a, a programming language, there are other applications. If you write it in narrative, you have all the imprecision of writing in narrative. And that can be easily unambiguous uh, in English and probably most other languages using both, but not overlapping, using a formal grammar, which is now normative, and that's what has to actually happen by an implementation. You can then argument that in English narrative to provide the semantics. What does it mean when I have this particular construct and, uh, and exceptions? And so the combination of the two, it's very bad style editorially to say in the na narrative, what you've already stated formally in the grammar. It's unnecessary and the two will get out of sync over time. When you add new functionality to the grammar, forget to update the narrative, et cetera, and which one wins and you'll get unnecessary queries of that. So for example, you might be building a library. Oh, here's our library to deal with financial things in a Java environment, query facilities. You have a configuration file. Maybe you're building a tool or you have a process and this is how you configure all of the particular uh, people or applications who are going to use this. And what's the syntax of that configuration file? Don't invent your own. At the very least, use XML or something like that. But that will have a grammar. If it's in fact XML, then you'll write a corresponding schema for that. And that will become part of the normative specification and says that, OK, this particular feature uh, has to have this construct to drive it. And here is the grammar for it expressed as an XML schema. And so uh, a script, you could have examples. Here is a script you could feed to this tool, which does all kinds of queries, and here's the required outcome. So again, um, the script itself would be written uh, according to the grammar, and it would be an example, but it's in fact needs to be valid for that particular thing. So we talked about this. No value is added if the narrative simply repeats what the grammar indicates, and we talked about that. Now, it's not always possible or desirable for a grammar to be complete, in which case the narrative can be used to add constraints. So the grammar might not be, say, 100% of things. If you say, if you give me a query, you have to put these things in this order, it may very well be that there are exceptions to that rule that are not easily expressed uh, in the grammar or clearly or at all. And so you say, yes, in theory, you could construct a, a query. So an English sentence, uh, you could say, the man carried the house to the lake. Well, you know, it's unlikely a man can carry a house, but that's not syntactic. That gets to do with the meaning. And so you could very well say, well, uh, the subject uh, has to be a noun that's plausible or whatever. So you have a constraint that says, well, yes, the syntax allows this, but these particular kinds of occurrences or instances of this are not allowed. That is, the grammar is constrained as follows. And so that's certainly normative, but it does uh, show that the grammar, uh, as complete as it is, might not be everything, that there are exceptions to the rules and they might be expressed in, in language narrative form rather than some formal note. If you can do it formally, all the better. So it can be very useful to be able to programmatically extract the grammar from a specification and run it through some tools. So firstly, you, um, 
as I said, in the C sharp spec, we have an HTML comment in the markdown and it says, okay, the following is, uh, an ex is a, a grammar, or it, it detects the grammar and it will then extract that, write it out to a file and run a particular grammar validation. Actually, it extracts it for the whole spec because it all has to hang together. Then it runs a tool that actually uh, validates to see if the grammar makes sense. Is it ambiguous? There's all kinds of reasons the grammar might have syntax errors. You've got it wrong. It's ill-formed. And so, uh, and then as time goes by, you add a new feature to your spec. You need to extend the existing grammar or add new uh, rules to it. And again, uh, you need to make sure that correct. And you need to make sure that when you copy that into the spec itself, you don't introduce editorial errors by misspelling or those kinds of things. And so not necessary, but if you don't have this capability, then it's at the whim of the editor or reviewers to visually check to see that any grammars cited in the spec are actually valid. So this is an important thing to have, uh, but non-trivial to build and to, uh, to manage. So what notation will you use? How will you express constraints? Will you have a tool that allows you to uh, programmatically verify uh, these kinds of things. The best time to find out about a problem is minutes after it was created when the editor and they made a change that wasn't valid rather than months or six months later when you do something and you're ready to ship the spec and you find there's something broken that requires non-trivial revision and things like that when long after people are done with that uh, consideration. So again, collaborative stuff with tools uh, is a good way to go. Questions? We've got one that's uh, related to a different kind of grammar, um, and that is, is the Oxford comma allowed in specification writing? I think this is a, a great question to kind of speak to that editorial narrative um, points you were making, Rex. Right. Um, I have started using it probably in the last 10 years once I understood it. Uh, in, in, I think, 99.99% .99 of the cases, um, it doesn't matter, but there are occasionally things that do. And there is, in fact, an interesting case out there, a legal case, where a multi-million dollar settlement hinged on the presence or absence of that comma. That's the scariest situation. But um, for formal technical writing now, I use the Oxford comma. So the last entry in an enumerated list before the and and the or always has a comma. So I think practically it doesn't hurt. Uh, again, whatever approach you use will be in your editor's guidelines. And, and when you're reviewing contributions by others, you have to go through and make sure that is the case. But uh, I think it doesn't hurt. And there are theoretical and maybe practical cases of it might help. Like you're required to have A and B or C, you know, and things in the precedence ordering and how that works in terms of English. And so again, the Oxford comma and notes or some notation that you explain early on uh, helps to understand potentially ambiguous situations. Any others? That's so, it. We've got about five minutes left. Right, we're a little late, but we're handing good grenades. So the last thing we're going to cover was 10, which is essentially the same thing as the grammar. So if you've got fragments, well, we said the grammar would include things like XML uh, schema, for example. Uh, but if you've got examples of data and code uh, or configuration files or whatever, and you put them in the spec, it would be really nice to know that they are syntactically correct and they actually produce the data you say or that this is the data that results from some particular situation. Again, um, we put HTML comments in the GitHub stuff and in the handout, I've given you uh, URLs to go and read the user manual for some of these tools to see what all we've, uh, the syntax we've used and how we've done that. Uh, one fine day, I thought maybe I should start an open source project to try to do this in general and see if we can make it usable across multiple projects. So basically, um, uh, it's important that examples of well-formed work and produce the claim behavior. It can be challenging to build the tool to extract this, particularly when they contain only fragments. So when the example in there, you extract it as a standalone thing, okay, done. But if it's in fact just the relevant three lines of a, of a 50 line program, how do you get the, uh, the, the infrastructure there behind that? 
And we've done a pretty good job of a tool that does that in the C sharp spec to which I provide a URL. But again, non-trivial things to think about. Now the rest, I think uh, you can read offline. It gets more into nuts and bolts other than to say that if uh, a mainstream a spec that fails to recognize and handle other than USA English characters and source files and data might run into opposition, that's not a spec failure. That's a project of the software failure, but the spec itself would have to factor in what it says about any restrictions of, of what kind of environments intended to use. So the scope uh, could say this scope is uh, for USA English or it's for this or that or whatever. So uh, the rest then gets into nuts and bolts of um, details of things which have a little more information in the actual handout itself. So questions. We have one last question, um, which is, do you have any advice for distributed systems, composite systems, for example, that are um, composed of vendor products um, minim with minimal development to implement beyond integration glue? The uh, question asker says, I'm unclear on how external references such as IETF protocol RFCs or vendor product dependencies should be represented in a spec. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Do they mean that the specification is distributed? I believe that the question uh, speaks more to how, like a, a specification that might be created by multiple systems coming together. This the author may right. be referring oh, certainly. to. Yeah. Well, certainly um, uh, the accepted way of doing that is that it don't you're you, you're utilizing other specifications that are out there, and they are of course under the control of another group. So you refer to them. You have a normative reference that says by by insertion, it's as if everything in there is a normative part of the spec and is a requirement. And you can have a bibliography that has informative things that, oh, this provides extra information, but is not necessary. So certainly you can bring uh, those into the fold and um, uh, certain SDOs require that you get permission from those referred to places so they know you're referring to them. And the most important thing is, is that when you refer to other specifications, whether you choose to make them dated or undated references, if you say we're referring to Unicode or to some IE, uh, I, uh, uh, IEEE or IETF, then is it this particular year? If you say a year, then the world knows that your version of this spec is dependent up to that point and doesn't rely on anything that's evolved since then in the dependent upon specs. And then you'll have if they if they uh, modify their spec, then you would need to monitor that and decide whether or not you need to modify yours to take account of new requirements and changes in behavior. Maybe they've deprecated some facilities. Alternatively, if you have a dated reference to it, excuse me, undated, then you're always pointing to the latest one. The good news is you're always pointing to the latest. The bad news is you might not know there's an even later one that has requirements that don't agree with what you're actually promising. Or that will require some fine tuning. So um, leverage on all the others. Everybody out there is writing specs, official or unofficial, and um, and take full advantage as you can. But you need to then monitor what they are doing and probably create an informal, if not formal, liaison uh, between your committee and their committee, so that you're each obligated to notify the other when you make uh, decisions that might adversely affect what they're doing or could, imp uh, could uh, impact what they're doing. That would just simply be a courtesy. Uh, one other thing that when you talk about distributed, um, I, I've worked on a project in the last year or two that's a web-based standard. That is, it doesn't look like a single document. That certainly is the way most of us deal with things these days. It doesn't fit the model of uh, say ISO, or even Ecuador International, I'm not sure about Oasis. So again, if you would like your, stat, your spec to be published basically as an HTML sort of table of contents front end to uh, GitHub, then go for it. But again, that's not going to be acceptable by a lot of the mainstream international and national standard development organizations. Yet it is the way a lot of us do stuff. And it also can minimize the way, you know, the world has long since stopped thinking uh, of uh, text as a paginated fixed size, uh, you know, A4 or US size page. And so again, that should be a factor in um, uh, this decision making. So again, 
Last chance at questions. All right, then I'm I'm done, ladies. Thank you so much, Rex, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we just launched one last poll to see if you are interested in a follow-up Q&A on this topic. So please take a moment to answer that before you log out. Um, also, just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Rex and Candice. Right, thank you, ladies. Thank you for attending, everybody.